nobody's name in here. If your name's not in here, there's no reason for it unless you just are a perfect person, which is rare. Uh, <laughs> and if, if you do, Pastor Woody will be glad to send out one of these um, de decals to anybody who just need one or puts their name in here. And then you can get the address on the uh, internet or uh, on the uh, Facebook page. And uh, gentlemen, if you remove your hat. Dear Lord, we come to you um, on behalf of this, uh, the people's names in this book. We pray that everybody in here is being taken care of and being looked after by, by you and your uh, loved ones. And I pray that everything um, in the community is going well, that um, pray that Woody's message hits the spot for everybody in this, in this congregation as well as everywhere else. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Appreciate you. Good morning, Rockin' Country Church. <laughs> Got a short message for you today. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's probably going to be pretty short, actually. It's uh, one of the shortest books in the Bible. And we're going to learn a whole book today. How about that? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about a book today. Uh, if you want to go ahead and open your Bibles up, it's going to be uh, the third epistle of John. The third epistle of John, which comes right after the second epistle, which is right after the first epistle, which is right before Jude, which is right before the last book in the Bible, which is Revelation. Okay? That's where we're going to be today. All right? We're going we're gonna to be in a couple other places, but primarily right there in that, in that, uh, that book. And the reason being is, is because God put this on my heart this morning that um, this is a absolutely unequivocally, if that's a word, if I said that right, it don't matter. <laughs> you got the message. This is the absolute best congregation I have ever been a part of. And I sing your accolades to the Lord daily and thank him so much for all that he has done for this church through the people of this church. Uh-oh, my buckle popped loose. Thank goodness it's my buckle, right? Huh? Yeah, well, I don't need enough, to tell you the truth, in my book. Now, it doesn't show, but... Yeah, hey, I think I lost a quarter of an ounce. Okay. Not in, yeah, I haven't had lunch yet. But anyway, the point is, is that this church is the absolute best church that I've ever been a part of and haven't been a part of a lot of churches. I know that a lot of you have been in church all your life. I have not been, but I am so proud to be a part of this church. And when I say the church, I mean the congregation. And in this epistle that we're going to study today, we, uh, it's, it's a letter to uh, a, a guy by the name of Gaius, or th that's how I'm going to pronounce it. It's G-A-I-U-S. I don't speak Greek or Latin or Hebrew, so I'm just going to call it Gaius, so bear with me if I say it wrong. And it's a, uh, it's a letter to him thanking him basically for being who he is. And I know that in RCC Bible Study TV, Chris is going to do 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John here pretty soon, but I wanted to... Uh, be obedient to the Lord, and so he put this on my heart this morning, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about the epistle, the third epistle of John. It's an awesome, awesome book, very short book, very, very short book, and we're going to study one of the books of the Bible today and do the whole book. So with that, we're going to go ahead, and we're a praying church for those friends who are here new today and haven't been here before. We're a praying church. We have seen miracles happen through prayer. We believe 100% in prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God and asking with God and communing with God. And so we do a lot of that here. So if you're not used to being praying and being prayed for and praying, well, stick around. You'll get used to it, and you'll find out that it's a great thing. It's a great thing because God answers prayers. He does. He has blessed this church. I could tell you so many stories of how he has just continually, continually, continually blessed this church over and abundant. Simply because we do as he calls us and commands us to do, which is to love each other. And this is why I love this church, is because you love God. It's just that simple. It's just that simple because you love God. 
and your love is, is expressed to others. We'll get into all that in just a second. We're going to get these youngins out of here, let them go have their fun in their class, and then uh, we will get started with our teaching today, okay? So let's pray. Guys, if you'll remove your hats. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for each and every day. We thank you, Lord, for the breath of life itself. We thank you, Lord, for the word of God, which is given to us through the scriptures. That word of God is Jesus, our Savior. We thank you so much for all that he has done for us and all that he will continue to do for us. Continue blessing us and watching over us and guiding and directing us for your glory and your glory alone. Father, I ask you to use me as your tool, as your vessel. Use Miss Terry, Miss Kathy, and whoever else is teaching those youngins. Use them, Lord, to, to bring forth the word, which is Jesus Christ, so that they may and we may come to a better understanding of the love that you have, us, have for us through our Savior, Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen? Amen. Amen, Bentley. As far as the congregation, while those kiddos are going out, I want to share two things with you real quickly. Number one is, is uh, uh, for those of you who are visiting here today, or actually I hope you're not visiting, I hope you're just new members that hadn't signed up yet, all right? <laughs> okay, but uh, I want you to know that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, is it our, our steak night is the second or third Friday night? Second Friday. On the second Friday night of every month, we do a BYOB, which is bring your own bucks, okay? Bring your own dollars. Uh, we do a uh, dinner, a steak dinner over here at the golf course. Well, lately it hadn't been too good. Matter of fact, it's been pretty terrible. Not just bad, it's been terrible. And so I call for those of you who, who join us regularly, and we generally have about 30 or so people there, I talked to uh, Stephen Lepper, who owned, who owned the golf course, and he has made note to the new members, uh, the new owners, that they will make it up. He says, you give us another try, and you will be satisfied. So, the second Sunday of every month, uh, second Friday, second Friday, keep me straight, the, sec the second uh, Friday of every month, we do a steak dinner. Uh, they have steak and chicken and hamburgers and I don't know what all. But anyway, I get steak. <laughs> steak and what? Bar food. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. We have a sign up list back there and it starts at 6 o'clock and it goes till about 7.30 or so. Yeah, they have salad, they have steak, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I know I'm getting too far into that. It's a good, it's going to be a good steak because if it ain't, we're going to find another place to go. And I've already forewarned them that and told them that. And they said, come, please come. He says, we will, you will be amazed and you will be uh, astonished at the changes. So, you know, there it is. We'll hold them for the word until they prove themselves wrong. So if you can join us on the second Friday night at 6 o'clock at the golf course right up here, uh, we will have steak night. But we do need, to, uh, need you on the sign-up sheet back there. All right? Simple. The other thing that I want to thank is, is all those folks, and I know Chris spoke about it, all those folks who, who helped with the... Uh, the troop yesterday with the open house with the uh, trail life man it was awesome these guys put so much effort into it and work into it and we had uh eight boys come in ten boys eight or ten boys come in and we're looking forward to more and more boys signing up if you don't know what trail life is briefly it's like the boy scouts but it is all christian based if you don't know what the american heritage girl is it's a like the girl scouts but it's all christian based and we're fixing to get that uh, charter for the uh, girls as soon as i can get all that stuff finished uh but we're already going with the boys this is kind of their wall over here right now and uh anyway it is it is awesome and it will do you proud to see your child grow up in the in the ways of the lord all right and that's what that's what's going to be taught all right with that let's get on with our teaching today we're going to be in the third epistle of john <clears throat> i hope everybody's found it by now the third epistle it would be after two, which is after one, before Jude, which is before Revelation, which is the last book. 
So find the last book and go two books forward. There you go. All right. I wanted to share with you today a book in Scripture. <coughs> Our text today, like I said, is the third epistle of John, the first and second epistle, and then the third right before Jude and right before uh, uh, the last book of Revelation. Chris, I know I don't, uh, you're going to do those on RCC TV and uh, uh, I'm not trying to, to step on your toes in any way, shape, form, or fashion, but, you know, it may be a week or two before you do it. Or Okay, take, take some notes, because, because this is actually, even though it's a very, very short book, there's only 14 verses. 14 verses, and that's it. But it's a powerful, powerful book, and we're going to talk about that today. Um, in my heart this morning, God put on me to, to teach on this book simply because my heart belongs to this church. I've told you before, when I started this church 11 years ago, we just celebrated our 11th anniversary. When I started this church 11 years ago, there has been nothing more important in my life than building God's kingdom by building this church. Time, money, effort, whatever, it doesn't matter. My heart has been to make this church successful. We have had our ups and downs, and we will continue to have ups and downs. Guess what? That's a part of life. That is a part of life. You deal with them, you overcome them, and you carry on. And that's what we do here at Rockin' Country Church. I asked Chris a while back, and I felt this same passion or compassion for him that I feel for this church, that God has a calling on his life, and that calling is to, right now, be an associate pastor and learn what it takes, as I had to learn what it takes, as those before us had to learn what it takes to establish a church and pastor a church. So Chris, who just took off, he is, he is your associate pastor. And as you can see, he's doing announcements. He does this. He can do the back, the music in the back. I mean, there's not much he can't do. And I feel the same way about many of you. You guys work hard. You work hard for this church. You work hard for God. And I'm so appreciative of it. And this letter is to, uh, to Gaius is the same letter that the, in the same sense that I feel for you is that I, I want you to know how much I appreciate all that you do. This is accolades to you. Giving glory to God, though, because only God can empower you to do what he's called you to do, whatever that happens to be. So we always give glory to God. The calling on Rock and Country Church is to build God's kingdom. That's the reason that we're all here. We're all here for God. We're not here for ourselves. We're not here to, for others to see, uh, oh, boy, that's such a... Uh, uh, awesome church look at their parking lot it's all full of cars and must be a lot of people there they must really serve good food there or have really good music or whatever no it's because we come here as fellow believers to worship God the God that we believe in John writes this epistle to a particular person there's only one other uh, epistle in the New Testament that is written to a singular person, and that's Philemon, written by Paul. This gospel here, or this epistle here, was written to a particular man. John is writing to this particular man to tell that particular man how awesome he is and how much John and God appreciate all of his efforts. John starts out in verse 1. He says, To the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Whom I love in truth. John is stating that because of the common truths of our faith, of our faith, the love of Christ abounds through their relationship with one another. 
as do we here at Rock and Country Church. Our love for God unites us for the glory of God. It brings us together as brothers and sisters in Christ, not as just members of a congregation, not just as people who happen to go to church on Sunday, but it brings us together in fellowship as brothers and sisters and children of God. And this is what John is trying to get across to Gaius. He says, you are beloved by God and you're beloved by me, by John, because we have the same faith and the same love for the same God. And that's what we have to have. We believe in the one true God, which is God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Three deities in one, but still one God. In verse 2, John says, Beloved, I pray that you might prosper in all things and be in health just as, our, as your soul prospers. Now, he kind of prays this backwards, if you will, because the way God would actually put it is he says, I pray that your soul will prosper, that your very soul will proper, prosper in the love of Christ, in the love of God, in the love of the Holy Spirit, so that you may prosper in the work God has called you to do complete you see we first have to have the power of the Holy Spirit living in us in order to do God's work you do not have the Holy Spirit unless you have Christ scripture teaches us that you do not have the power that God will empower you to do what he's called you to do unless you have the truth living in you Jesus says I am the way the truth and the life John 14 6 In verses 3 and 4, in verses 3 and 4, John says, For I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. I hear, and I hope I to hear from uh, you visitors. I'm not going to call you visitors. I'm going to call you new friends, okay? You're not visitors. You're new friends. Because you know what? We'll see you again. If we don't see you here, we'll see you somewhere else. And someday we'll see you in heaven. So we're going to call you new friends, all right? I am blown away from time to time when I hear people who have come to our church and spent time with, our, with our, our, our congregation, not time with me, time with our congregation. And they say, you know, when I came to there, the first thing I felt was the love of the congregation. People talked to me. People said, hello. What? You mean somebody actually spoke to somebody? Man, if there's, if there's one of you who do not, did not get spoken to today, my apologies. And if you will holler at me, I'll speak to you all day long. Talk to my wife. She'll talk to you for a month. <laughs> but I guarantee you, I guarantee you, we love you. We don't know you, but we love you because God loves you. And the love of God lives in this congregation. I don't mean in this building. I mean in this congregation. It lives in the heart of the hearts of the people who come here to Rock and Country Church. And this is what God has called us to do, to love your neighbor. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength, right? God, Jesus' first command they left us with. Second command Jesus left, left us with was love your neighbor. Who's your neighbor? Your neighbor is anybody other than you. Love your neighbor as you would have Jesus love you. John 13, 34. And that's what we practice here. Now, we don't do it perfectly. Uh, Chris gets mad at me sometimes. I never get mad at Chris. <laughs> no, we just disagree sometimes, but we agree to disagree. My point is, is that there's love that lives in this church, and it's not our individual love. It's the love of Christ that lives in us. And I have people many times who will come to me and say, man, I just, I just love being here. We had a young lady... She's not here today. She just joined our church last week, our congregation. And she says, uh, she put on Facebook. She said, when I first came to the church, I could not feel, uh, I could not understand and could not sense until I, I got there how much love was in that church for her. Because that's what we do. 
You don't come to this church to get judged. We're not the judge. Guess what? Every one of you are better than me. How can I judge you? Remember when Jesus tells us, says, why in the world are you trying to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you got a board in your own eye? Why in the world are we trying to judge somebody else whenever we got enough to work on? I always say this. I said, if you worked on your own problems, you'd have a full-time job. And you wouldn't have time to work on anybody else's problems. And we, we don't, but we love people. We love people. Why? Because God loves them. Because God loves them. I love to hear the accolades from brothers and sisters about the increasing walk in the love of God from other brothers and sisters. And I feel the joy, an immense joy. And I can point some of you out and I won't call you by name, Kathy and Chris and Johnny and on and on. I won't call you out, but I know the progress that you have made in your Christian walk. And some people might say, and I could say, but I wouldn't say because I won't say. Because it wouldn't be true. Oh, well, that's because of the preaching. No. It's because of God. It's because of God. It's because of God. It's because the Holy Spirit is alive and well in this church. And I have seen, and when I say church, I don't mean the building. I mean you. You are the church. But I see your walk increasing in the love of Christ because you're recognizing more and more and more the love that he has for you. And I see you growing in Christ, growing in his love, growing in his knowledge and his wisdom. Because you love him and because he loves you. And it brings my heart joy to see your victories. Because we don't claim any defeat here whatsoever. Satan is a punk with a capital P. And in Jesus' name, he is to flee according to the scripture, according to the word of God. So what do we do? We profess Christ and Satan must flee. But the growth of the church, the growth of each and every one of you that I see on a regular basis just astounds me and it brings my heart so much joy to know that I can be a part of it and that's how I see myself it's just being a part of it just as much as you're a part of my life I'm a part of your life just as much as you inspire me I hope I inspire you just as much as I lift you up and edify you I hope you lift me up and edify me because that's what brothers and sisters do we love each other In verses 5 through 8, John writes to Gaius, and I write this to you, if you will. Beloved, that is a powerful, powerful word, beloved. It's not used just, just nonchalantly through Scripture. What it means is, is that just as, just as Jesus is the one and only begotten Son of God. It is a term of endearment, meaning that you are as loved as much as Jesus loves you. You are loved by the church, by each other. John writes this with a, with a profound statement of, you don't even know how much I love you. And that's how I feel about this church. And when I say church, please understand, I'm talking about the individuals. I'm not talking about the building. We keep changing the building. But you are who I'm talking about. And John writes to Gaius and he says, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. What you have borne, who have borne witness of your love before the church if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such 
that we may become fellow workers in the truth. Fellow workers in the truth. That's what we are. We're fellow workers in the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6, right? And we are fellow workers in the truth. We are fellow workers for Christ. When Christ was on the cross and he was crucified, he announced to the world, he announced to the whole world, not just to his mom, not just to the disciples, not just to God. He announced to the whole world, it is finished. My work is finished. And he eventually ascended into the, into the heavens and is seated at the right hand of the Father. But whenever he first left, Matthew 28, 19 through 22, he tells us, the Great Commission to go out into all the nations, go out into all the people. Paraphrase, sharing the gospel, teaching, and making disciples. That's what we're commanded to do. We preach that all the time here because this is your ministry here on this earth. You're not here for you. You're here for God. You're here for his purpose. You're here to continue the work of Christ. And we all can't be evangelists, which go out in traveling all over the world. But as individuals and as the church, we can and do support those who work, who do the works of God's gospel. Sharing the message from person to person, town to town, and country to country. There are people who travel the world to do nothing but evangelize for Christ. There are people here who do nothing but share the gospel in this community. Jim and Beverly Poole, he mentioned earlier. Jim and Beverly Poole live right up here in Kemp. They have been in street ministry for I think 14 years 14 years, they go into some of the places that you would not go. They go into some places that you would not go, a husband and wife. And they minister to people that you would generally ignore. They would minister to people that you would generally want to ignore. But they don't. And that's one of the reasons that we support their ministry. And this is what... Paul is, I mean, John is telling Gaius here, he says, you support the ministry of God. You support the ministry of the gospel. And now he's talking about how people come in from visitors and we have visitors periodically and we support them. We try to support their ministry. We have other ministries that we reach out to. We support a ministry in Mexico, in the, in Mexico. The guy that was here who, uh, he was invited here by one of our brothers. He came here and he says, you know what? I'm here to work. I'm here to work to earn some money so I can build walls for my church and a roof. What? Yeah, he had, I think, two walls for his church and he needed two more and he needed a roof. And he goes into the jungles, if you will, of Mexico and preaches the gospel. Those are the type of ministries that we support. The guy didn't come up here begging for money. He came up here to work, to earn money, to build his church. How fascinating. Those are what, the people that we want to reach out to. And this is what John is saying. He's saying those are the people who, know, who do not do it. And when he says he, he doesn't take anything from the Gentiles, in other words, he goes out and he doesn't demand any money in return. He simply goes out and does what God tells him to do. And God supplies all of his needs according to his riches and glory, according to Philippians 4, 19. God will supply all that you need according to the riches and glories in Christ Jesus. So we wonder sometimes, well, are we going to have enough money to do this? Are we going to have enough money to do that? Let me tell you, friend, and I can sit you down and tell you example after example after example after example how this church, this, this church, this building that you're sitting in right now was a blessing from God. It was a gift from God. And I'll be happy to share that with you. But on and on and on, God has supplied every need for this church at every time we have needed anything. Give you a real quick one. When we first started the church 11 years ago, we needed some children's 
furniture for the children's church. You know, the little bitty tables and the little bitty chairs that we don't fit in. I mean, the little tiny ones. That day, we prayed for furniture. We got together and we prayed for furniture for our children's church. A lady in Malakoff somehow, some way was directed by God to call us up and said, hey, that day, that very night, she called me up and she says, hey, I have a daycare over here in Malakoff and I have some extra children's furniture. Could y'all use some? I said, what? I said, yes, we prayed for that today. She says, well, I'm gonna set it outside my front door here at the daycare, come by and pick it up. She didn't say come by and drop me for a hundred bucks. She said, come by and pick it up. You know, we still have that furniture. We still have that furniture. Now that's just a small example, but I'm telling you friend, Philippians 4 and 19, where it says, and God will supply your needs, all of your needs, according to the riches and glories in Christ Jesus. Now see, there's, there's an in Christ Jesus there. It doesn't mean because you want them, okay? It means those who are in Christ Jesus for the purpose of Jesus' ministry, which is to build the kingdom. God will supply all you need. And God has supplied this church over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. When we needed a new septic system, we had the money. When we needed, get this now, if some of you know air conditioning, when we needed five air conditioning units, five air conditioning units, for those of you who really know about it, five, five ton air conditioning units. Well, actually there's four and then one, three and a half, which ain't cheap. God supplied. He has blessed this church over and over and over and again. And what he will do for one, he will do for another. In Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. See, there's the key. And if you're not in Christ, don't go around and say, oh yeah, well, pastor said he's gonna give me a brand new truck. I've been praying for a brand new truck for about, oh, I bought it in 2001, so that's 20 something years, 22, 21 years. I guess I didn't pray for it the first five years. My point being is that God will supply all you need, not all you want. When I needed a new motor, he supplied a new motor for my truck. And I kind of like my old truck. It just keeps on rolling. Of course, it is a Ford. <laughs> anyway, it only had 457,000 miles on it. All right. So God will take care of those who take care of his business. See that? God will take care of those who take care of his business. We support not only financially, but spiritually as well. Through prayer through moral support, through kindness, through generosity, through God's love, we support those who are doing the works of God. You support those who are doing the works of God. In my handout here, which you were given one, I hope, you will see the different ministries that we have here, the different ministries that we support. Your donations, your offerings, etc., support these ministries, not to make them a big, nice, cool-looking ministry, but to support the work of Jesus Christ. That's what it's for. He mentioned uh, Billy's branch of life, Dr. Billy Corn. We support dollar, Dr. Billy Corn, and we have for years. Why? Because he does God's work. He does God's work locally. This is not a foreign ministry. This is a ministry that's right here in Kim, Texas. We support that. Why? Because he's doing God's work. And this is what John is trying to, to express to Gaius. He says, you are beloved because of the works that you do, which is to build God's kingdom through your works. Now we know, and you know, and I hope you know, I hope you realize, salvation does not come through your works, right? Salvation, just in case, salvation does not come through works. It is a free gift of God. Ephesians 4. I uh, can't think of the verse. It is a free gift of God. 
given to you because God loves you. Not because you're great, not because you do all these great things. It is because, is it Ephesians 2? All right, Ephesians 2. Look it up. It is for you as a free gift. A free gift from God. And all you have to do is accept it. But because it is a free gift of God's love given to you, we do the works Jesus has called us to do. See, over in James, it tells us the faith without deeds is dead. Why? Why does he say that? Why does he say faith without deeds is dead? Because if others don't see the works that we do because of the appreciation that we have, how in the world are they going to know why, what we appreciate? Why are we so appreciative? Why do we thank God for what he's done for us if they don't know? So your faith, your believing and trusting in the Lord has to come from to other people, you showing them your faith by expressing it through your deeds. Which is what this church does when a visitor comes in, a friend comes in, and they say, how are you? Glad you were here. So you are blessed to have you with us today. I hope you come back. I hope you stay with us, et cetera, et cetera. We do a, a, a feed, a, a luncheon, every, the first Sunday of every month. They mentioned it earlier. What was the menu? Barbecue. Oh, good. We're going to have barbecue. Okay, it's free. You know what? We always say, if you, don't, if you didn't bring anything or whatever, if you're new for the, that day, stay. Stay. We, we have plenty. Why? Because we want to fellowship with you. We want to love on you. That's what this church is, is known for. That's what this church is known for. Uh, we support not those who are doing God's work for themselves. And we're going we're to talk about that here in just a second. Not for those who are doing God's work for themselves, but doing God's work for his kingdom. Because in the letter here, John further writes, we need to be careful. We need to be very, very, very careful of who we support and who we take care of. Now understand that as scripture says over in Deuteronomy 25 and also in 1 Timothy 5 17 through 18 and this is paraphrased it says do not muzzle the ox while it is treading the grain. Now this is from scripture New Testament and Old Testament. Now what does that mean? In other words, it says, do not forsake the sharing of the wealth, if you will, or the support to those who are doing the works of Christ. To those who are doing the works of Christ. So we're in essence commanded by God, if you will, or directed by God, maybe an easier way to understand it, to support ministries. Oh, well, I'm just going to keep all that money for myself. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not going to give them any of it. This is God's money. Well, it is God's money, but it's not God's money for you to hold on to. It's God's money to be used for the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what we do. That's why we support so many ministries. But then we have ministries out there, and you'll see them on TV, radio, other places, that say, if you'll send me a hundred dollars, God will bless you with a thousand dollars. That's not in scripture. And if it's not in scripture, it is not true. Matter of fact, if somebody uses those lines, they're lying. They're lying to you. Because that's not what scripture says. Now scripture does say that if you sow, you can reap 30, 60, 90, 100 fold. If you sow, well, what does sowing mean? Sowing means contributing, supporting into the ministries of God, the work of God. Please understand the ministries of God is the work of Christ. That's what the ministry of God is. That's what your ministry is, is to continue the work of Christ and to support it. You say, well, I give my money. Well, that's exactly where it goes. It goes to the support of the church, the support of these ministries, the support of making this church happen. Do you know if we didn't have your tithes and your offerings, we couldn't keep these lights on. If you turn out all these lights, guess what? It's pretty dark in here. 
Matter of fact, it's pitch black. So see, we need the lights on. Else I can't read, right? We need your support to support these ministries. Because a lot of people say, well, how can I help? Well, our trail life here was a very good example. We've got uh, seven adults, eight adults, something like that, that contribute to it regularly in their efforts. And it's growing and growing and growing, and it's changing the lives of those 10 kids. Uh, we actually have 11 kids, okay? We have 10 that are about this tall. Then we have one that is about this tall. <laughs> Brother Brett, Brother Brett, raise your hand, man. That guy right there is probably one of the most joyous people you could ever be around. One of the most happy-go-lucky guys you can ever be around. Sometimes you have to stand him in a corner to get him to calm down. But, but he is awesome, let me tell you. And so we now know him as number 11, okay? But he, he is awesome, and we thank him. I love his spirit. His spirit is that of the Lord, let me tell you. It truly, truly is. He's an awesome guy. So those uh, are, let's go to verse 9 here, verse 9 through 11. I wrote to the church, this is John writing again to uh, Gaius. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who's, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Now, it just simply means that he likes to be the center of attention. He likes to be esteemed. He likes to be the one in the spotlight. It's all about him. You ever been to a church like that? You ever been, heard of people like that? Some people, you, you go to talk to them and you say, well, you know what? I was talking to this fellow the other day and he had this, that, and the other going on in his life. And then that person will speak up and say, oh yeah, I had that. He said, well, and then this, you know, he was going through this. Oh, I had that too. You know, I knew a woman one time. She's the only woman I've ever known that had prostate problems. Because <laughs> it didn't matter what, what somebody else had, she had it. And it kind of astounded me. I don't know how it worked, but according to this person, that's the way it was. You see, there's people out there who think, well, it's got to be about me. Because I, after all, am me. Well, let me tell you, friend, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And, the, you, and you will find the more that you make it about Jesus, the more your light will shine. It will, won't it, sister? It will. The more you make it about Christ, the more your light will shine. So if you want to be a shiny penny, Get with Jesus. Let him, shine. Let him polish you up. I imagine we can all use a little polishing, right? A little scrubbing. Kind of hurts, but we could all use it. Verse 10. Therefore I come and I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, <clears throat> prating against us with malicious words. That means just simply speaking against them. Just simply trying to say, oh, don't believe him. Oh, that's not right. Oh, he's lying, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera in order that it all be about uh, Demetrius. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to put them out of, the, and, and wishes to, to put them out of the church. In other words, we have people from time to time that will tell other people, oh, well, you shouldn't give to that, you shouldn't give to that, you shouldn't give to that, you shouldn't give to that. Well, I'm telling you, friend, God says you give to whoever God tells you to give to. You give to whatever God tells you to give to. Uh, God tells us in Scripture, and we're going to go there. 2 Corinthians 9. Go to 2 Corinthians 9. Now I have mine marked. So if you go to 2 Corinthians 9, I want to share with you what God says about who and what and where and why and how you should give. Now remember, God speaks to our hearts because God lives in our hearts. 
So if you're ever wondering, well, how much should I give? Some people ask me, well, you know, this is how much I make a year. Should I give off of the gross or should I give off of the net? My reply to be, do you want the abundance of, of blessings or do you want the net of blessings? I mean, that's something that you need to decide. Well, should I give to this church or should I give to that church? That's something you need to decide. Should I give a tenth? Well, the Bible says you got to give a tenth. Remember, we're not under the Old Testament. We're under grace. And the scripture I'm going to share with you here in just a second explains this very profusely. A tenth is a rule of thumb. It is a command for the Jews. It is a command for the Jews. But for the Gentiles, which are us, it is not a command. If you want to give 10%, give 10%. If you want to give 12, give 12. If you want to give three, give three. Whatever, whatever, whatever. You do not have to give. God's not going to say to you, uh, you know, four years ago, on December the 12th, which was a Sunday, you gave 8%. Shame on you. God's not going to say that. Scripture tells us plainly what we're to give. Look here at verse uh, 7, uh, verse 6. This is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, of course. It says, but I say to you, he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. That's a pretty good rule of thumb there, right? That's something to kind of consider. And then consider this. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Don't get confused, and others will use this scripture to confuse you. Yes, you see, right here in scripture, it says that if you send me $1,000, God will give you more than $1,000. Why? Because you can't outgive God. That is not what this scripture is saying. It is simply saying, if you sow a little, guess what? You're probably going to reap a little. And this can be many things other than money. It can be your time, your effort, your, your spirit, your prayer, on and on and on and on. If you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Remember I told you earlier where it says, if you want to be number one, God will, will shine on you and let his glory shine through you. And so you will be a brand new penny. Not a million bucks, but you'll certainly be a shiny little penny, especially in God's eyes. But I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one, underline this, highlight this, let each one give as he purposes, his, purposes in his heart. As he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly, nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Don't think that people and people will try to put this on you. Well, you have to give more. I was in a church one time. I couldn't believe this. It really shocked me. But I was in a church. And I'm not trying to put down any denominations, but in an, in an old timey church, I'm going to say. And they had on the wall back here a like a TV monitor, kind of like I had the clock up there. And it says they would take up the tithes and the offerings, then they would take it to the back and they would count it. And it said on there how much they took up. Hypothetical figures. $500. The pastor, I was sitting in this church. The pastor said, folks, we only took up $500 today. I know your pockets are deeper than that. We're going to pass that plate around again and you need to give some more. Yeah, in church. And guess what they did? They passed the plate. And it came back, because they took it back in the back and they totaled it up, hypothetical. And it came up 300 more dollars. And the pastor said, folks, look at that sign back there. We only took up $800 today. You guys better dig in your pockets, get some more. That ain't enough. And we're going to pass the plate again. 
And they passed the plate the third time. And I thought, are you serious? Now, I wasn't a big church goer, okay? But I thought, you know what? All I got is $5, $10. I don't know what I had. But I put it in the plate. All right? And they sent it around again expecting me to dig it. I didn't have anything else. I did not have anything else. I felt guilty for not having anything else. And then when they sent it around the third time, I left. Why did I leave? I left because of my guilt. The guilt that they put on me for not having enough to give to them. I didn't have enough for me, much less for them. And so I got up and left. I wanted to be in church. But I can't pay my way in. Because I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I will never have enough to pay my way in. God paid it in full, brother. He did. So I don't have to pay my way or attempt to pay my way in. Because God says, I left that church with a guilt feeling, a guilty conscience because I was broke and didn't have any money. And God says, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart. In other words, as God puts on your heart to give, that's what you're to give. There's not a 10% rule. You don't have to give 3%, 1%, 10%, 20%, 50%. You know what? You want to outgive God? Because it says, Scripture says, you cannot outgive God. Um, uh, Malachi, is this Malachi? It's not Malachi. Uh, Micah 3, the last book of the Old Testament, chapter 3, verses uh, 8 through 10, uh, whatever that book is. Malachi, thank you very much. I knew one of my guys would pop up and give it to me. I, I can't always bring up everything into remembrance, all right? I, I got my memories about that belong. But anyway, it, sorry, I forgot what I was going to talk about. Oh, I'll give him God. You think you can outgive God? God says, and that's the only place in the Bible. Let me tell you, the only place in the Bible, he says, test me. Don't test God anywhere else. Don't test God in anything else. But you can test him in your giving. And I'm not trying to tell you this so that you will give more, all right? You give as God purposes on your heart. But he says, you think you can outgive me? Test me in this. I guarantee you sometimes, and there's many ways to test God in your giving. Your giving is not just monetary. It's also in your time and your efforts, etc. I try sometimes, and I even challenge God. I said, look, Lord, you said in your word that I can test you in this. So I'm going to test you in this. This is what I'm going to do, blah, 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 blah. And I mean the blessings pull back on me. Not monetarily now. But the blessings pour back on me to where I'm almost weighted down with just thinking, man, God loves me. God loves me. He wants to bless me and he wants to bless you just as much. So your giving has to come from your heart. It has to come from your heart. If it doesn't come from your heart, please, and I, this sounds strange coming from a pastor, please keep your money in your pocket. Because I don't want those bad, bad vibes being in our church. Oh, I got to give a hundred dollars. I don't want to give a hundred. Then don't give a hundred dollars. Oh, all they want is my money. I don't want your money and neither does God. Guess what? It ain't even your money. You give as God puts on your heart to give. And God loves a cheerful giver. So you see, God is satisfied with whatever you give as long as it comes from your heart. As long as it comes from in here. If it comes from feeling guilty, then you got a bad pastor. Because he's making you feel guilty for something that you can't do. And God will never make you feel guilty. But there are people out there who will. Back over to First John or John three. Give as the Lord purposes you to give. I see in this congregation every week, every week I see in the hearts, in the souls, in the faces of the con this congregation 
the love that lives in them and that love is Christ. I've heard so many times from so many people that have been here that they felt as though this is where they belong because they're accepted as they are, as they are, not judged, not judged, just loved, just loved. In verse 11, it says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. He who does evil has not seen God. Now, what is evil? Evil is anything that doesn't line up with the will, the word, or doesn't glorify God. That's what scripture says. It must line up with God's will. It must line up with God's word. And it must glorify him. That's why this church glorifies God and not each other. I mean, we have people here who work their fingers to the bone. And they got bony fingers for it. But they work hard not for their own accolades, not for their own pats on the back, but because they love God and they know God loves them. That's why we do it. That's why we're here. John concludes his message. He concludes his message. Oh, verse 12. Demetrius is a good testimony for all. And from the truth itself, and we also bear witness and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius was like-minded with the works of God, with the works of John, who was an apostle appointed by Jesus Christ, directed and guided by Jesus Christ. Demetrius was a, was a man who was devoted to serving God by serving mankind. That's what we're called to be. He was just like Gaius, just like John, just like all the other apostles, just like Paul, just like Christ. Scripture tells us that we're to grow each and every day more and more to be as he is. So each and every day we're to grow in our spiritual walk as well as our physical walk into the likeness of Christ. To be more and more and more like him. Not that God will love us any less if we don't accomplish it. Because guess what? None of us. Anybody in here just like Jesus? I think we missed the mark quite a bit. Matter of fact, Paul tells us over in chapter 3 he says, uh, of Romans. He says, there's no one righteous. No, not one. Not one. But each and every day with the righteousness of Christ living in us, we grow more and more and more to be as he is, as Jesus is. And this is what Demetrius was. Demetrius was on fire for God. He was sold out for God. He was a child of the Most High God. Then John completes his letter to Gaius, and he says in verse 13, I had many things to write, but I did not wish to write them to you in pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly. We shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. Now, I could sit here, and I could probably go down the line. And I could say, Laurie and Chris, Bubba, and just on and on and on and on. But I know y'all want to go eat, so... I won't go name by name. And some of you I don't know yet. Especially those new friends. But I see you face to face. And so as. Instead of writing. You a letter or a note. I want to tell you congregation. Face to face. And I'm speaking to each and every one of you here. I love you. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Al you know I love you brother. Dave you know I love you. Billy you know I love you. Okay? I love you as Christ loves you. You ladies, I don't love you like my wife. I love you like a sister in Christ. Okay? Each and every one of you. 
And I want to tell you face to face, I'm so very, very proud of each and every one of you and where you are at. And I look forward to seeing you grow more and more and more in Christ, just like I will. I'll grow more and more in Christ every day. But so many times a preacher will get up here to tell you how bad you are. I don't want to tell you how bad you are. I want to tell you how great you are. And in the eyes of God, he loves you to so much that he died for you. That's how much he loves you. And I love you that much. No, you're not going to get everything you want. But you'll get everything you need. As far as I'm concerned. If I can help you with anything, I will. If I can guide you and direct you in any way necessary to lead you more and more to be like Christ, I will. Am I going to help you to rob a bank down the street? No. <laughs> but Christ loves you so much he died for you. He sent his one and only beloved son that whom shall ever Believeth in him shall not perish, but receive eternal life. Yes. I don't deserve it. But because he loves me, I get it. It's the free gift of salvation. Never lose sight of what we do. Never lose sight of why we're here. Never lose sight of our goal, which is to build his kingdom more and more each day. Why do we do it? Because we appreciate what he has already done. We appreciate what he has already done. May God always be glorified with your life. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I give you all praise and glory and honor. Father, I lift you up on high. I know I don't do it right all the time. I know I mess up from time to time, but you're such a loving Father. You forgive no matter how bad I am. You still forgive me. Why? Because you love me. Not because of my love for you, but because you love me. And because you love me, I want to express my love for you. Father, if you will guide me to do anything and everything and whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever your heart's desire is, that I will do. And I know the will of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 40. I believe it's chapter 6 verse 40 the will of God is that all who look onto the face of Christ shall believe in him and receive eternal life that is God's will for each and every one of the people here in this building right now and actually it is God's will for everyone in the entire world that they would receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and therefore re receive the free gift of God which is eternal salvation to spend eternity with God someday I pray that it's you I pray you are a child of God if you congregation and those who are watching throughout the world if you have not received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior it, Jesus makes it very simple all you do is simply mean in your heart you call on Christ and invite him into your life. To invite him into your heart. Invite him into your soul and your spirit. And the word of God says that if you knock. Or I knock. And if you will open the door. I shall come in. And dine with you. In other words Jesus is saying that I will come in and live with you from this place day forward if that's you today and you have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior I encourage you to do so you don't know if your, etern your eternal eternity is going to start tomorrow it could start today
Each and every one of us could drop dead today. We don't know when it's going to start. But it will start. Out of all the people ever born, every one of them have died except for two the Bible speaks of. Christ himself died and rose again. And because he died and rose again, he says that you shall live also, John 14, 19. You shall live also with him. So if that's you today and you have not received Jesus as Lord and Savior, just these simple words, but meaning it in your heart, just simply say, you can say it out loud, you can say it to yourself, God knows your heart, you can say it to your friend or neighbor. Just say, dear Jesus, and mean it in your heart, dear Jesus, today is my day of salvation. I pray, Lord, you will forgive me of all of my sins. Wash them clean as white as snow. Come into my life. Let my life be devoted to you from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. God bless you all.